All right, parents, thank you for spending some time with me today. When I initially uh, agreed to, to give a parent talk, uh, the parent council told me that I was gonna be about 10 to 15 parents. They did not tell me that I was gonna be recorded uh, for YouTube. So this video talk is actually gonna go onto YouTube. So the pressure has raised astronomically from the time that I agreed to give this parent talk. I wanted to, uh, to spend some, some time with you, maybe the next 10 minutes, just introducing myself to all of you being uh, someone new to, to Vancouver College. Building that trust and rapport with parents for me is, is fundamentally uh, important. And I wanted to introduce myself to you through what I call a life map. And a life map is a, a visual representation of some of the successes, some of the challenges that I've had uh, in my own life. I got the idea from a movie called Inside Out. And in the cartoon movie Inside Out, the main character speaks of these core memories or core, core moments which have an indelible mark on your life at the time and a transformational impact on your life in the future. So these are some of my core memories or core moments. So everything uh, begins with birth and that's a, a positive. I'm from the city of Toronto. Please don't call it Toronto. Uh, I also believe that we're going to have to be renamed the City of Champions after the 2019 historic run of our Toronto Raptors. Nice, got one person from Toronto here, that's nice. Uh, I grew up with uh, two, two loving parents, an older sister. I try to spend as much time as I can uh, heading home. It's obviously difficult and challenging living on the West Coast, but I do try to, to head back East as much as I can. My first experiences uh, in school were actually quite negative. They certainly uh, were not positive. And I think my parents were always trying to understand why does their hardworking son not just come home with straight A's, but an A on his report card. And it was in middle school in grade seven that I was uh, actually diagnosed with uh, a learning disability. And that's a, a challenging moment for a middle school boy to, to understand and to comprehend because in middle school, all you want to do is to fit in. You never want to stand outside of the box. And now all of a sudden, I was different from all of my classmates. If I had to boil that experience down to like one memory, it would be on Tuesdays or Thursdays when the rest of my homeroom was able to go to these fun, engaging classes like home ec and shop and, and, and phys ed. I had to take the long walk to portable number five uh, which was the furthest portable away from the school to see my resource teacher, and her name was Miss Hazard. <laughs> so you can imagine how I was stigmatized by my peers as I left the room by myself to go see Miss Hazard. Now I had a, a really remarkable character come into my life, uh, my grade seven and eight homeroom teacher. His name was, was Mr. McKernan. I think you'll always remember your best teachers, your, your not so great teachers and very few in between. And Mr. McKernan created a, a genuine connection with me from day one. And he had two really uh, immense, important impacts on my own life. Uh, the first was by the end of grade seven, I knew that I wanted to become a teacher. And it was because of his relationship with me that this was my true vocation. And the second uh, impact that Mr. McKernan had on my own life is I was really struggling with my learning profile, trying to understand at this point in my life, I'm, I'm not a strong student. Well, how am, I, how am I possibly going to progress? And he sat down with me in a one-on-one -on -one setting and said, you know, JP, don't worry about your performance. Just focus on your character because character is destiny. And that phrase, character is destiny, has really become uh, part of my mantra, part of my educational philosophy, which is how important it is for us to be teaching our boys not just academic work, but also to be teaching them character and how, how fundamental that is to their lives and seeing their personal and social growth. Dr. Robert Brooks said that possibly the most critical element to success within a school is a student developing a close and nurturing relationship with at least one caring adult. Students need to feel that there is someone whom they know to whom they can turn and who will act as an advocate for them. I know Mr. McKernan played that role as my, my charismatic adult in my life and that's kind of the drum that I beat with our teachers in middle school. And there's a saying by Michael Reichart that it's less about how a boy learns but for whom he will learn and that relationship is paramount um, with improving student learning in the classroom. 
Now, in grade eight, I was um, a high level hockey player, very good hockey player, or at least I thought I was a very good hockey player. And I all of a sudden was cut from my first athletic team. And to make matters worse, my best friend's father was the coach. So you can imagine how that soured some relationships that I had uh, with my friends. I never saw myself as a student and all of a sudden, now I wasn't seeing myself as an athlete anymore and it was a really challenging time uh, in my world. If you ever have an opportunity to, to read a book called Season of Life, uh, it's written by Jeffrey Marks and it's, it's about the life of Joe Ehrman. Joe Ehrman is a, a former uh, NFL football player who starts a ministry uh, and he speaks to his football team about the myths of manhood. And the first myth of manhood that maybe your son is, is living right now or is experiencing uh, is that the person that's bigger, faster, and stronger is actually more of a man than someone that is not necessarily uh, an athlete. And I, th I think at this time in my life, that's definitely a myth that I was personally experiencing with being cut from my hockey team. Now, I was admitted to St. Michael's College School, Faith and Learning Community uh, in Toronto in grade nine. Uh, and I would say that was probably the lowest point in my life. I went to St. Mike's without any friends. I had very few from my neighborhood school that, that went off with me. I wasn't a student, I wasn't an athlete, so what was I? And I was in middle school. So you come back to the, the question, who am I in middle school? Who do you identify with? And that was a challenging time. Uh, I probably had some body image issues at that time. I was kind of short and rotund, and I dedicated myself. For some reason, I said, you know what, I'm gonna work out at lunchtime probably to build some confidence in some way. Uh, and I started working out at lunchtime and it was like I was looking for someone to come into my world that was gonna believe in me. And I remember the exact exercise, I was doing like a lateral pull down in, uh, in the Universal Gym and in walked this really important figure uh, at St. Mike's, his name was Paul Forbes, he was the varsity football coach. And he walked up to me and he said, JP, and I looked up at him and had no idea how he knew my name. And he said, I really think you should play football. And I shot out of the lateral pull down machine and I was like, do you want me to run a 40 time right now? Mm -hmm. Like when is practice? Cause I'll be there. Uh, so I started playing football and football gave me a foundation. It gave me a social circle. Once I had that, that social circle and those friends and brothers that I could rely upon, it taught me about character from there. Uh, the importance of hard work, the importance of commitment, um, being, you know, showing grit and, and having resilience. And eventually my academic marks uh, started to improve and, and football really gave me so much in my life. Now my last couple of years of university, I was getting recruited to play at different Canadian schools. Um, I used to weigh 230 pounds. I played middle linebacker, uh, probably look a little bit more tough than I do now. And I decided to, to attend the University of Guelph. And why would you go to Guelph, right? There's Western, there's Queens, and there's McGill. Well, it really felt right. It, uh, it was close enough to home that I could spend time with my, my family. Uh, I loved the campus, I loved the city, and my coaching staff as well. So I studied sociology as well as history while I was there. Uh, in my last couple of years, uh, I became an academic All-Canadian, and then from there I graduated with distinction. And the only reason I mention that to you right now is because that was like a 180 degree turn from where I was 10 years before. It was like this caterpillar to butterfly moment uh, in my life. Now I always knew I wanted to, to become a teacher so I, I attended the University of Toronto. Um, and I was in a master's of teaching program. I wrote my, my major research paper on character education. And I was lucky enough to meet the man on the left who's uh, Father David Katulski. I think when you head off to a secular community, uh, sometimes you can lose touch with the fundamentals in your life, one being faith, one, another being prayer. For me, uh, that was definitely a part of, of my life at Guelph at U of T, probably at the, the beginning component, um, really began to fall away. <laughs> Uh, from my faith and it was actually Father Dave that inspired me to attend church again and, and to really take my faith seriously. He probably has the most inspirational story I've ever heard uh, in my life and I hope I'm able to share it uh, with your son in the coming, uh, coming months. 
so shortly after U of T, I was hired at Upper Canada College as a, as a middle school teacher. I taught uh, grade seven, grade six, social studies, uh, English. It's an all boys school, 1829, very traditional school. Uh, I coached the varsity football team, basketball team, track and field, had a, had a role in admissions, uh, had a, a pretty big role when it came to character development there uh, as well. And what I really took away from my time at UCC was how important that relationship is with the boy in the classroom and how that will drive student learning. I also learned uh, a little bit about the, how significant and vital uncommon traditions are to, to really binding a, a school community as well, which I, I really see here at VC as well. Now in my last couple of years at, at UCC, I was just there for, for almost a decade. Uh, I met a pretty incredible woman who popped up into my life and, uh, and in my, she was in medical school, I should say, at, at U of T. Um, and in my last couple of years, uh, she was going into the, the residency process, so she was ranking um, different schools across Canada and they were ranking her. Uh, and based on our rankings, the computer spit out a location and it could have been Winnipeg, it could have been Edmonton could have been uh, Moncton, but it came out as Vancouver. So we were pretty lucky with the way that the, the residency match came up. Um, we've been here for the past four years. Um, Sophie's a, a pretty incredible woman in terms of uh, just how she's able to operate and, and how intelligent she is. I, I always say this, that she is more athletic, more beautiful, a lot smarter. So I'm a very, very lucky man to have her uh, in my life. When we moved here, we had uh, an incredible amount of change. We moved cities, we started new, basically new jobs, jobs in new communities. Uh, so there's been lots of change in our lives. Just before leaving uh, Toronto to come to Vancouver, I was actually hired at uh, Collingwood School uh, in West Vancouver as the director of middle school program. And I would say that most of my days kind of felt like this. Um, and I might have to shorten my remarks on this now that I know that this is going to go on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I often say this to my friends that I don't think I could have learned more in any other environment over the last three years. Uh, I would say that uh, I feel like I have my PhD in crisis management as well. Um, just lots of sudden changes at Collingwood uh, while I was there and lots of, lots of fires and problems that I needed to solve while I was there. Uh, what I also will always take away from Collingwood just is how the strength of that faculty um, really helped to um, stabilize Collingwood during a, a really difficult time. And beyond that, just uh, the importance of, of finding innovative practices in, in the classroom is something that I'll, I'll always remember as well. In the last year, uh, Sophie gave birth to a little boy named Hugo. And uh, Hugo has taught me a lot about myself. Uh, he's given me a lot in terms of, of my patience level. And it's really, he's really given me uh, a sense of empathy for, for all of you being here and, <laughs> and what you go through in your, your struggles. And I know you're thinking to yourself, you have like a 14 month old at home and you're talking about how to raise a middle school boy. Well, I, I have 15 years of education in middle school. So I hope there are some tools and some knowledge that I can provide you today that you can use in, in helping to parent and raise your, your son at home. Now that kind of brings me to today, which is why are you, you at Vancouver College? And I think when you look at my life map and you look at the, the different challenges that I've had in my own life, at each of those turns, it's always been a Catholic educator that's been able to put me on a path towards personal or social growth. And that's why I came back to a faith and learning community. It's because of Catholic education and it's because, because of Catholic educators and, and that's why I'm here. So. There's kind of a 10 minute spiel on, on Mr. Cav. Uh, at this point, I wanted to uh, transition into our middle school uh, talk about how to raise a middle school boy. The big idea for today is that middle school is a time of vulnerability and it's also a time of transformation. Teenagers. I believe teenagers are God's revenge on mankind. I really do. I think, I think one day the good Lord was looking down over his creation and said, let's see how they like it to create someone of their own image who denies their existence. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
because I have read the Bible more than once, cover to cover, and it, it never mentions how old the devil was when he rejected God's authority. If I'm guessing an age, I'm saying 16. Devil got his driver's license, drove to Georgia. That's all I know. So I think based on, on your laughter, uh, maybe some of you are experiencing that, that irritability or that critiquing or analysis of maybe your authority. Uh, but you really have to have an understanding that our boys are acting that way because of the stage that they're at and their development. So uh, the major part of today's presentation is going to discuss um, the different internal changes as well as external influences um, that might be leading them to behave in such a way. And the last part of the presentation today is going to be really a conclusion and a review of some of the strategies that I've tried to provide you to help you um, parent and, and help your son get through what can be and are challenging years. So the first thing that's making your son uh, really feel a sense of vulnerability or insecurity are these physical changes that are taking place between the ages typically of, of 10 to 15. And what you're seeing is an increase in testosterone production and that is going to cause reproductive organs to mature, muscle and bone to grow, facial hair and hair to appear all over their body and their voice is going to deepen. Now from there, you're also going to see that puberty hormones are stimulating sweat glands. So with that, you have oilier skin, you have acne, you might also have body odor. And that, in a nutshell, is boys feel awkward and they're growing into their bodies at this time. So that, that physical change that's taking place or those changes that are taking place are creating that vulnerability in their lives. Now, I grew 14 inches from the time I was 15 to 17, so I was a late bloomer. So if your son hasn't grown at all, it could still happen. I promise you that. There are other internal changes, mental changes that are taking place at the same uh, time frame. And based on their brain development and where they are, boys are more likely to act on impulse, misread or misinterpret social cues or emotions, get involved in accidents or fights of of kinds um, engage in, in dangerous or risky behavior. Many of the decisions that we make occur at the front of our brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. That's where rational decisions are made. That prefrontal cortex is going to develop until the time that, that they're 25. All right? Many of the decisions our boys are making actually occur in the amygdala, which is at the center of the brain, which is really responsible for emotion. So our boys are making many of their decisions based on their emotion and not necessarily their rational mind. All right. Now, I have the ability to interpret social cues. I'm looking out into the audience right now. If I see a parent who is frowning, well, then I can interpret I said something wrong or something that they disagree with. Our boys don't necessarily have that skill yet. So we have to have that understanding of where they are in their brain development. Now. I think we can all recognize that our boys are more irritable at this stage of the game. Um, there's a hormonal effect that's occurring that is making them more irritable at this age. And they might be more likely to question your authority or to critique you, whether that is getting out of bed or driving them home from football practice. And although that is a pain, once again, critical thinking, it's core competency in the new BC curriculum. So that's something that we're trying to drive at school, which is their ability to critically think. Um, so hopefully it will become, your communication with them will become a little bit more respectful in time as they learn how to properly analyze and, and critique you and possibly your authority. Young man, get up. We're going to be late for school now. Yeah, yes, I'm up. I'm up. Come on. Now. Uh, I'm getting up. I mean, we're leaving. I'll be down in five minutes. No, nope, we're leaving now. Come, get up Ugh, now. I mean, hello. How was your day? Fine. How was practice? Fine. And how are all how are all your classes? Good. Do you have any homework? I guess. <laughs> Do you or not? I don't know. Anything fun happened today or? I guess. I uh, I don't. Know. How many questions are you gonna ask me? Young man, hey, watch it. <sighs> Can we go to McDonald's? No, we have food at home. Oh, the food at home sucks! No, it doesn't. Okay? Why can't we ever go? We don't need to spend that money. Ugh. 
Did you talk to any girls today? I don't know. What about that girl? Stop. Katie? Did you? Mom, stop. Did you finish your homework? I don't know. Did you finish your homework? I did most of it. You'll go finish your homework right now. Go. You'll finish your homework. Excuse me? Nothing. Do you want me to tell your father what you just said no. to me? No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I take it back. I'm sorry. What do you want for dinner? No. Okay, I'll make spaghetti. I don't want spaghetti. Well, then what do you want? I don't know. What? I don't, I don't know. I don't care. I'm making spaghetti then. Uh, no, I don't want that. Dinner's ready. I love that video because I think that actor does such a great job of showing that irritability and, and that questioning of parental authority. Is anyone else experiencing that? Raise your hand. A little bit? Okay. No, it is a stage that they're in. They're going to get through it. Okay. I will promise you that. Now, one practical tool that, that based on that video, I, I would recommend, uh, the machine gunning of questions when students enter the car, probably not the strategy you want to use. Uh, what I would actually, what I would try to do is put it, put it on its head. So you'd want to create a conversation versus asking 50 pointed questions. Boys are going to be on the defensive when they're asked questions. So instead of asking, what did you learn in socials class today? You can ask something like, or you could make a statement instead. Uh, I heard on the radio that there's an election on October 21st and just let silence fill the air. See if he takes the baton or picks up the stress ball in that moment. He won't be defensive because you're not asking him a question that's quite pointed, okay? So try to start a conversation over asking a numerous amount, uh, you know, millions and millions of questions when they enter the car. That's just one practical tool uh, that I would recommend. So. Uh, there are some external factors which are playing a, a, a pretty key role in, in your son's life currently, and one is peer pressure. Middle school students actively seek and avoid, I should say, actively seek to avoid being humiliated or embarrassed. If you look back to my life map, what was the most humiliating thing that I still remember? Tuesdays or Thursdays, long walk to portable number five to see Miss Hazard. I was doing that by myself. In middle school, you're always trying to fit in. So you're, you're struggling with your identity, what your strengths are, who do I associate with, what will I be good at later on in life. Right? So that's a, a really vital piece of information that you have to have an understanding of with your son at this time. There's an intense fear about feeling foolish or a sense of shame. I had one boy uh, that spoke to me. He said, I cannot be the same person at school as I am at home, which comes back to the point. He can't be truly who he is at school because there, there could be some fear associated with showing truly who he is. There could be some embarrassment that comes with his identity, the things that he likes. Now, in each school, there is a specific culture to that school. And the culture that I see most frequently in, in my time working in middle schools is that it is a smart to be cool culture versus it's a cool to be smart culture, right? Boys more are likely to, to emphasize their social standing and their relationship with others versus their academic progress and work. And it's up to the teachers, it's up to the parents to be on the same page so that we're messaging to our, to our boys that the reason that they come to school is to learn. And it's to learn about academic work, but it's to learn about character. And their social life plays an important role of who they are when they're, they're at school. But that academic learning piece needs to be first and, and foremost. Parental influence is going to diminish over time. Anyone experiencing this right now? Kind of all of a sudden, your influence in their life is beginning to, to wane and the influence of the peers is beginning to, to increase. And it comes back to that, that smart to be cool culture. Well, they're trying to become more independent in their lives, right? They're trying to begin to find some space from, from their parents. And they might feel embarrassed. They might feel, feel uh, fear or feeling foolish if they are to, to go to the movies with their parents at 4 p.m. on a Saturday night, all right? Now, some parental support, and I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, 
the first piece of advice that I have for you is that you are the primary educators in their life. Pope Francis has stated that, and that's really been maintained by the church for decades of time. You are the primary educators. So if you need to find resources for your son, if you need to, to read an article on parenting, if you need to find him help or counseling outside of school, that is something that you have to do. I am beginning to call our next generation, your sons, the control F generation. Very few of them like to read anything in depth, right? So if you give them a question to respond to, it's control F, search the word, scan, 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 and all of a sudden I have my answer. And I feel like that command or control F generation to an extent is beginning to, to creep into our, our parenting where we're no longer the primary educators, where if there's a conflict in my son's life, I'm gonna send a very quick email to an administrator or to a teacher or to a counselor to solve this because I don't have time to deal with it. And I'm preaching to the choir because you're here right now. So I recognize that you're here and that's fantastic. But you are the primary educators and, and that's a, uh, such an important, idea to, to remember while walking out of this presentation. Provide them with strategies when it comes to, to peer pressure. Uh, I had Dr. Graham Wong. Can you raise your hand? There he is. He came in and spoke to our grades seven through nine today. He did such a, a spectacular job of teaching them about vaping and the, the health consequences associated with vaping. Our homeroom teachers are going to follow up that lesson with providing them with strategies if they were to encounter at a party a vape, well, how would they act? So I wanted to give you some strategies now that hopefully you could reiterate at home. Uh, if your son was to encounter a vape coming out at a party, and that's just one example of peer pressure, uh, the first thing that we want to do is we want to have a, a short response that's already been, been practiced or rehearsed, okay? So vape comes out, their friend says, hey, do you want to do you want to smoke this vape? Do you want to hit this vape? Is that the right language, Dr. Wong? Do you want to hit this vape? Is that not bad? Okay. Well, I've got this tool in my tool belt. No, I'm fine, thanks. Short, assertive response. Really, really fundamental when it comes to peer pressure. No, I'm okay. You might think maybe a joke. A joke could also be a, a way of your response to, to get through that moment in time. Another strategy uh, that I would use is, is planning ahead. So as soon as my son sees the vape come out at a party, well, I'm gonna exit stage left and I'm going to go to another room where hopefully some more wholesome things are occurring. Um, or even planning further ahead, I know who's gonna be at the party, so maybe I won't attend that party. All right, short assertive responses from there, uh, planning ahead. There are few hills that I want you to die on as parents. There's 1A and there's 1B. 1A is knowing who your son's friends are. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. I reiterate that with our boys on a daily basis. Your son's friends are a reflection of him. helpful piece of advice, try to make your house the social center of his life. All right, if they're in your basement, well now you control the behaviors that occur in that basement and you can also keep a watchful eye over who he is associating with. All right, know your son's friends. So peer pressure playing a role in our boys feeling a sense of vulnerability. From there we also have bullying that could take place. And the B word is used, uh, I think, too frequently in today's society. Bullying, I wanted to reiterate what the definition of bullying is. It's behavior must involve three things, three pieces of criteria, an imbalance of power, it must be continuous or repetitive, and then finally there must be intent to hurt. When I receive emails uh, or, or boys come to me and, and talk to me about a possible bullying situation, um, I would say pretty infrequently, does it actually line up with those three pre pieces of criteria? Well, it hasn't been repetitive. This was just, this just happened today. So that's actually mean behavior. Or, you know what? You guys were friends yesterday. So it doesn't actually involve necessarily an, an imbalance of power. 
So having that definition is, is key for, for our parents. We have the OAS anti-bullying program at Vancouver College. It's, bullying is something that we're going to take quite seriously. Uh, my goal, my north star each and every day is to ensure that we have a safe and positive learning environment. Uh, and bullying contravenes that north star. Uh, I receive emails from uh, teachers, I'd say weekly, and there are these little receipts, these little updates that say, hey, Cav, or Mr. Cavaluzzo, uh, you should look out for boy A and boy B. I've seen some behaviors in class that just don't sit well with me. Or I saw these three boys in the hallway do this to boy B. And I investigate those situations. From there, um, we would put consequences into place if bullying was to occur for the bully. And we would try to put a support plan into place for the individual that was affected by bullying. For you, for parents, beyond this definition, what else do I need to know? Conflict is natural. Conflict's a good thing. We get to learn about our character. We get to bounce back from adverse situations. We, we show grit. We show perseverance. So conflict is a good thing. They are going to experience conflict when they leave Vancouver College in university and in the working environment. Think about the strongest relationships that all of you have right now with a partner, with a peer, with a friend, with a colleague. You have that strong relationship a lot of the time because you've had your ups and your downs. You've had conflict with them and that's made you stronger. So conflict, it is natural. Please message that to your son. Educate. Conflict management skills. Uh, one of the core competencies uh, that we're supposed to emphasize in our classes is social responsibility. And with that comes coming to a consensus based on peaceful means. I speak to our boys about being able to self-regulate. Some of the language that I use is that your brain can steer your emotions. So when I'm feeling a heightened emotion, whether I'm sad or frustrated or angry, I can reflect on how I feel and train my brain to steer me back towards a more positive emotion. So please use that brain steers emotions mantra with, uh, with your son. Beyond that, conflict management. Today, especially, being open-minded. A fundamental skill that they all need. So the importance of being open-minded, having an understanding of what the actual problem is, and empowering them to come up with some solutions to get through that conflict. Those are other, other different strategies that you'd want to talk to them about. Define what the problem is, and then give them the opportunity to pick up the stress ball and come up with solutions to get through that moment in their life. When they are being bullied, also provide them with strategies, and this can occur. Number one is positive body language. Research shows that students are, that are bullied show negative body language. So shoulders down, my eyes are down, my head is down, I look negative. You want to tell them to show positive body language, chest out, shoulders back, eyes up. Positive body language first. From there, be assertive, short response, that's completely inappropriate. I'm trying to learn right now. Once a bully or a friend or a peer hears that, they're more likely to stop that behavior. I feel like with a lot of our boys, they just continue to allow the bullying or the name calling to continue, continue, continue until they have an emotional breakdown at the end of class because they're showing negative body language, because they're not standing up for themselves. They're not giving that short, assertive response. And that's something that you can practice with them, which is the last one, which is role play. Role play. All right, I'm walking down the hallway. I'm a bully. Billy, I'm going to say this to you. How are you going to react? What are you going to say? How are you going to look? All right, so, so role play those situations with them if they are being bullied. And if they are being bullied and you know it's bullying, it meets those criteria, please contact me. All right, please contact teachers. Uh, we don't want to have this type of behavior in our school. It contravenes uh, our faith and learning values as a community. All right, so bullying can play a role in why our boys are, are feeling a sense of vulnerability at this time. Social media. Technology. 
Technology as we know is, is highly addictive. The same coding that goes into the cell phone and creation of a cell phone is similar to that of a slot machine. Every time you pull that slot machine, a chemical is released in your brain called dopamine. And dopamine is an evolutionary trait. So every time we seek out something pleasurable, dopamine is released. That's why we seek it out. And that's the, now the same thing with cell phones, right? All of those positive affirmations that we receive on our phones, the retweets, the likes, the emails, text messages, those are all dopamine hits. Every time I pull out my phone, right? Highly, highly, highly addictive. Students' overusage of technology can mean a lack of connection with others. And that, that would be something that I would be trying to observe um, with my, my son. Is, is he so zoned into his computer, laptop, phone that he is now no longer engaging with others? And, and sometimes when you lose those social connections, you're going to fill that time with your phone because it's easiest. Whenever I walk into Manrail Hall in the morning, you'll see 10 boys all sitting apart from each other, all are on their cell phones. Some on social media, some might be doing homework, some are texting. And I think about like 1982, what would those boys look like in this cafeteria in like 1982? They'd be together, they'd be grouped, they'd be working on a maybe a project together, they'd be socializing, maybe getting into trouble together, I don't know. But that's just an observation every, every morning. We have a cell phone policy in middle school, which is boys are to put their cell phones into their locker at the beginning of the day, take it out at the end of the day. Uh, I would recommend that you don't text or call your son unless it's an emergency. Been a few times where I've, I've it's been a situation in a class <laughs> And uh, I've emailed a parent just letting them know there's a situation in the class and the parent already knew that the situation had occurred in the class because their son had gone to the bathroom and texted or emailed um, the parent. So we don't want devices to, to be a distraction. So please, please, please um, reiterate that message to your son. Um, with technology comes less empathy. Uh, with it comes pain, maybe pain from, from online bullying and decreased pro-social behavior. And we don't have to look very far. It was somewhat a blessing, or we were, I guess we could say we're fortunate that this talk was rescheduled because now I can talk a little bit about this. Um, students expelled from, from St. George's, 15 boys were either suspended or expelled um, from St. George's for their, their online use. And a lot of their online use in speaking to the administration at, at St. George's on a very general level had to do with meme use. Memes are pictures that have slogans on them. And some are very innocuous, some are, are harmless like this really harmless. And over time, you have memes that become a little bit more harsh, maybe even become discriminatory, maybe become racist, homophobic. And I know that the online chat that those St. George's boys had started off in a good way. Like, we're going to connect with each other. When I'm not at school, you guys can tell me what my homework is, right? So positive rationale for having that, that interactive group on, on Instagram. And we start off with some memes that look like the one on the right. And as a day goes by, the memes now become something that look a little bit more, more aggressive, a little bit more directed on the further right and each day goes by and the boys become a little bit more risky with their behavior. They're not able to self-regulate until we get to a point where we have memes that are homophobic, racist, prejudicial, discriminatory, and which are actually targeted at students. A parent sent me this. I found this absolutely I guess I could use the word flabbergasting. 
A recent study undertaken by Digital Awareness UK concluded that more than a third of schoolboys admitted to sending or receiving racist or homophobic pictures. And two in five boys see them every single day. According to Emma Robertson, the co-founder of DAUK, offensive memes are the source of much upset and anxiety amongst the young people we work with. They are also contributing to the normalization of racism, sexism, and homophobia. I believe there's some alt-right groups, there's some white supremacy groups that have actually decided to create these memes and post them online that boys our age would hopefully use them so that racism, sexism, and homophobia become something that's more normal, which is a diabolical thought. I spoke to you a little bit about Hill A to Dion 1A. 1B, monitor your son's technology, specifically social media accounts. If you take two things, two pieces of advice, two tools away from this talk, it has to be know your son's friends and monitor his devices. Gaming, right? Gaming's fun. Uh, I'll tell you this quick story. I w heard some strange noises coming from the boys' bathroom yesterday, and I thought, oh, that's weird. I better go and check that out. Uh, and I found two boys who were gaming on their phones during class, opposite ends of the bathroom, playing a cooperative game together. If that doesn't tell you about the time that we live in, they're playing a game together, faraway stalls, they left class. So if that doesn't tell you a little bit about maybe the addiction, I said, were, these, were those devices in your pocket? No, no, we went to our locker to get them. So they're being pulled out of class to go and game. All right, so have, have some empathy for our boys, but we also need to, to, to find a way to balance it in their lives. So the greater experience to gaming, specifically violent media, creates lower activation in the brain in areas such as thinking, learning, uh, reasoning, and emotional control. That is something I would discuss with my son. I was at a Safer Schools um, conference two Fridays ago, and he showed some mature video games for a minute, just like spliced clips. It was Mortal Kombat, Call of Duty, and Grand Theft Auto for one minute. I probably could look at the screen for maybe 10 seconds, the first 10 seconds before it became too violent for me to even look at. So we shouldn't just be monitoring their devices. We should be monitoring what they're actually playing and if they are gaming. Some of the things that, that I was seeing was just it, in, unbelievable in terms of the, the level uh, of gore. All right, so coming back to, to our sons with, hey, greater experience with violent media could lead to uh, lower activation in your brain in terms of thinking, learning, reasoning, and emotional control. Too much of anything is rarely a good thing. A message that I would give to, to our boys, to my sons, would come back to the importance of balance in their lives and how that's the key to their wellness. So not gaming for 90 minutes a day or, or two hours a day, but making sure that I'm going outside, that I'm doing my homework, that I'm connecting with others. And yes, there's a time for gaming, more appropriate gaming like FIFA, maybe NBA or Mario Kart and, and nothing violent. Dr. Paul Corkin, Mayo Clinic child psychiatrist, says it's normal for kids to want to play video games, but parents should pay attention to lines being crossed into addiction. Playing the games all night long, abandoning things that used to, used to be a source of great enjoyment, schoolwork, um, friendships, sports. Dr. Corkin says gaming addiction can often be a sign of a broader mental health issue like anxiety or depression. He says there are three important things parents who think their child is addicted to gaming should do. Number one, communication is key. It's a time to get more involved in the teenager's life and um, try to open up more channels of communications and, and, and really, really get a um, handle on what's going on in their life. Number two, it's important for parents to establish rules about screen time and stick to them. If teenagers aren't meeting basic family expectations, Dr. Corkin says internet time and devices should be treated as a privilege. And number three, don't be afraid to get them professional help. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Ian Roth. So some parental support. Um, 
the first place that I'd want you to begin is, is to model. Model pro-social behavior when you're at home. I know how difficult that is. When I go home, I go home, I get home at 5 o'clock and I see my son, 14 month old, and he's the most beautiful boy and I love him to death, but I still feel the urge to, you know, pull out my cell phone and respond to parents and to respond to teachers and maybe students. But when you get home, put your cell phone away, put it on a shelf, come back to it uh, when your son goes to, goes to sleep. Really model those pro-social behaviors. I was in church on Sunday and a parent next to me was on Facebook during the uh, gospel message. And I'm just thinking to myself, if I can give you all a piece of advice, please don't do that. Um, but, but model those pro-social behaviors. Um, don't text at dinner time. Just put it away. Leave it there. Establish a relationship uh, with your boy. Monitor their devices. Know that your son could have uh, social media accounts that are linked to him, so they're his name. He may also have social media accounts that are anonymous, that are burner accounts. So I would absolutely go home tonight and say, Billy, I'm now going to monitor your device. And if he has a really visceral reaction and you can see it, then there's something on his phone that he doesn't want to show you. I confiscate, I'd say one cell phone a day, just boy in the bathroom using it, or he's walking down the hallway texting or whatever it may be, taking it out in class. And every time I take the phone and I just press the home button and I look at the wallpaper. And I would say 50% of the cell phones that I confiscate based on the wallpaper, I know that that parent is not monitoring their son's devices because there might be a meme on it or there might be an inappropriate photo on it. So don't just press the home button for the wallpaper, but actually go into the phone. Don't allow them to make a mistake that they're going to regret for the rest of their lives. Technology guidelines. Um, three that come to mind is give them an actual time, yet you can game for 60 minutes a day after you are done your homework. Okay, so put a time frame on it. You can only use social media, you can only use technology in a common space in this house, so it's the kitchen or it's the living room where you can monitor their interactions and what's happening. This is the most key. Do not allow them to go to bed at night with their devices. That is when all the mistakes are made. So I'll get screenshots from parents saying, hey, you better monitor this. There's a situation right now between boy X and, and boy Z, and there's mistakes being made at 10 o'clock 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning when those devices shouldn't actually be in their room. So it's not only impacting their sleep, but now it's, it's impacting their day to day. So don't allow your son to sleep with his, his cell phone in his room. And then educate, right? You're the primary educators. Educate on what gaming does. Educate on, on what social media can do. And uh, I think we have safer schools coming in next week to speak to our boys about meme use, to speak to our boys about social media, digital citizenship. So I'm excited that they're going to hear that message. They're going to hear the message again from their homeroom teachers. So we're trying to cover um, our basis at school, but provide them with those same strategies, with those same skills and knowledge um, when you speak to them at home. Okay. Last one is, is pornography. This one's a little bit more of a sensitive topic, so I'm going to take my page with me to make sure that I'm, I'm saying uh, exactly what I want to here. Um, I believe CBC has reported that 16 to 23 uh, percent of, of adolescents are actively seeking pornography online. And I would assume that our community is no different um, from other communities. I read this quote from, from Dr. Ashcraft, and she said, the importance of parents and guardians in all aspects of adolescent development cannot be overstated, but their role in sexual education is crucial. Parents are the single largest influence on their adolescents' decisions about sex, and parents underestimate the impact that they have on their decisions. Three key pieces for you. The first is to focus on character beyond modeling it surround them with it. Any time is a teachable moment. So if you do monitor their device and you ha see that in the history they've, 
they've tried to look at pornography, well, there's a teachable moment for you in that time. They are thirsting for information, so meet them really with where they are in their lives. Uh, number two, don't judge your son. Speak to what por pornography does to humans. It objectifies men and women. It creates unrealistic expectations that are destructive in nature. It teaches the opposite of consent, which is a very hot topic, um, as it should be today. It is highly addictive, coming back to dopamine being released in the mind every time we seek out sex or pornography. Once again, comes back to dopamine being released. Um, and the Telegraph of the UK reported, and their research suggests pornography can actually shrink certain areas of the brain and dulls response to sexual stimulation down the line. So educate them. The last area is to develop their attitude and personal convictions towards sex. And this can only happen if there's trust, if there's respect and openness in your relationship with your son. I uh, wanted to, to use a, some Catholic teaching in developing their personal conviction towards sex. And these three principles actually come from Archbishop Miller's principles on, on human sexuality. So I would use three specifically in speaking to your son. The first is that each person is created in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, each human being is deserving of respect as a complete individual, not a sexual object that is to be discarded. Number four, human love is expressed in a way that is enfleshed and sexed. So sex is a way for a wife and a husband to express their love for one another. It creates a special bond between a couple and should be taken seriously and not acted upon impulsively. And five, human sexuality carries the responsibility to work toward Christian sexual maturity. So having sex carries an immense responsibility, which is creating a life. And as Catholics, we are committed uh, to delaying gratification. And sex isn't something that we would just jump into. It should be something that is unique between uh, a husband and wife. So in developing their personal convictions towards sex, I would um, certainly look at the Christian principles on human sexuality that Archbishop Miller has outlined for us. So we have uh, a very vulnerable uh, life that, are, that your boys are living right now through physical, mental changes that are taking place. And beyond that, these, these external influences like peer pressure, bullying, pornography, gaming as well. So at this point, I wanted to maybe take some questions and then I wanted to conclude at the end of the questions. And I'm hoping, hoping that I can give you uh, an accurate, appropriate response. So are there any questions about this vulnerable time in your son's life, certain situations that you might be experiencing that you'd want advice on? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know how many Instagram accounts they have, and uh, what's the one that disappears? Snapchat. Snapchat. Yeah. Um, even a check it that disappears. Yeah. I would uh, I would recommend if you if you can write this down, safer schools together. Um, they provide great education uh, to communities on social media. And they do a, a wonderful job of teaching you about the actual applications that they could be using. Um, for you and for any parent here, I would definitely have the device code. I would be looking at their social media accounts. I would tell them beforehand that I will be looking at your social media accounts. Um, our boys are quite clever. And they could also have apps on their phone. If you see two calculators on your son's phone, you'll know that one is actually uh, social media account that will be hidden from you. Okay, So there are different things that you need to be looking for on your phone. I know it sounds like I already don't know what Snapchat's called and now I need to find the double calculator on his phone. <laughs> it's like a Rubik's Cube you're trying to, to figure it out. I think by your son knowing that you care and that you're monitoring his device, um, that will lead him on the path towards proper digital citizenship. But once again, you're the primary educator, so 
research, research, research. Safer Schools can provide education for you, and there are other resources out there to help um, so parents. Yeah. Yes. As, yes, I would contact Safer Schools. Um, they give different presentations on, on technology use and what our boys or what our students are experiencing. Um, and there are other different providers out there that could give you that education. Um, I would also just kind of look, in, look on Google, look for resources that can help you um, improve your, I guess, your, your digital uh, IQ in terms of social media and what's out there and what our boys could be using. Um, the important ones to know now are Instagram, Snapchat, and something new called TikTok. TikTok is the one that's kind of blowing up and more and more of our boys are using, so those would be the three that I would be looking out for on their phone. Not too many of them are on Facebook, I'll say that. Yeah. Carrie. So November 14th, we have Safer Schools giving a parent presentation, and they will give you specific examples of what your son is experiencing and possibly experiencing online. Yes? So Safer Schools is going to be speaking to sevens through nines. So if you are in that age group, I would definitely recommend it. Most social media accounts, you need to be 13 to join. Some of our boys in grade five, grade six have Instagram accounts because they're, they're checking off the box. Um, so if you have a son that's anywhere from, I would say, grade five up into the upper years, I would say that the presentation would be great for you. Yes. Uh, yes. So we have in grade nine human sexuality that's being taught in grade nine science. And then um, during the year, there are going to be opportunities for outside providers to come into the school to provide some sexual education. Yes. Just because, like, so my son's coming from a Catholic school. Yes. They really didn't do any of that. They mm -hmm. kind of left it up to the parents and they, they wanted us to come to talks to how to explain that. But mm -hmm. I'm, uh, it's been very different coming from Ontario, where there is a very robust sexual education program um, to British Columbia. So that was one of the first things that I recognized in being at Collingwood, uh, is the level of sexual education isn't even um, that vast at a independent school that is secular. So I can see how there's a similar parallel to, to Vancouver College and Blessed Sacrament, which is, I believe, where your son is coming from but we will do our best. Um, we try to teach the, the archbishop's principles while we're teaching about, about sex, but that will be covered in, in biology units in grade nine and when outside providers come in to speak to our boys. Yeah. What else? Hi, Hi. Robert. Thank you, and uh, thank you to Dr. Wang today as well. I hope I think it's Dr. Wang. Dr. Wong. I use this um, mantra with them, which is character is destiny. So if you're showing kindness and respect to others, you're showing strong character, you're going to have a successful future. And if you're showing negative character traits, well, you're going to have a more negative future. 
So that character message, character is destiny, um, is key. I think coming back to the values of our school, um, the Blessed Edmund Rice's elements, so sticking up for those that are marginalized, that's a really important one, striving for excellence. So using the, the actual language that we use with our boys each and every day, so character's destiny, sticking up for those that are marginalized, striving for excellence, standing in solidarity, um, the concept of brotherhood. Well, how are you being a better man? Are you bringing hope into the room when you come into the classroom? Are you not? So those would be all phrases, um, character phrases and, and pieces of learning that I would reiterate at home with, uh, with your boys. It's a tough, tough age group. I think we have um, 100 new boys in grade eight and they're all trying to establish themselves, right? Um, socially speaking. And with that comes jockeying for social standing. Who do I associate with? Who are my friends? Well, he's treating him poorly, so I'm going to treat him poorly because I want to be that, that boy's friend. And I think by the time grade nine is over, um, they really have a better understanding of themselves and they have a better understanding of, of their character and what is, what is meaningful is their character, treating others with respect and, and being kind. So that's a drum that I'm, I'm trying to beat each and every day. Um, and if you can beat that drum at home, that would be, be wonderful as well. Okay. Yes? I have a, we have a son in grade 8 as well. Okay. Um, we moved to the school. And uh, I see the boys navigating their way and all the changes that are going on mentally and, and uh, physically and spiritually as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, has it ever um, been discussed that perhaps giving the grade 8 boys um, a grade 12 mentor or a grade 12 uh, your buddy uh, for a little while, just to give them a sense of, you know, this is, these, are, these boys have been through it all and maybe they can have a conversation every once in a while and maybe that person can become somebody that would inspire them and tell them it's okay. Mm -hmm. if we tell them at home it's okay, they're not always going to believe us, but if they get it from a third person and especially a, another boy in the school, it might have some impact. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, an amazing, amazing idea. Um, our, in school, you usually have the, the grade 12s and they're with the kindergartens and they're working together and they're running around the track during the walkathon and they get to connect with the, the youngest. And very infrequently do we have the oldest students with the middle school students who probably need it the most, like you described. So that's a, it's an amazing uh, idea and thought. We, we try to uh, give the grade 12s a voice um, during retreats and during certain traditions that we have. We had two grade 12 boys uh, that actually spoke today before Dr. Wong's presentation and, and told the boys about how they're addicted to vaping and the journeys that they've gone through. And you could see how powerful that was for the grade nines and the grade eights to hear because it was one of them. And this wasn't just some statistic, but it was actually one of them, a person that they go to school with. So that's um, a wonderful idea that I will um, bring back to the admin team. Yes. Um, the subtopics are not a question of if, they're a question of when. Uh, so alcohol, mm -hmm. sanctioned or unsanctioned, peer group, your home as, as a you know, location, sharing that information with other parents in terms of um, what will be going or not going on. But bridging the gap between what I do Gap my wife and I are trying to close growing up in smaller towns. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when do we, when do you see, and I'm sure it's different in, in different families and different communities, but when do you start to see alcohol as more and more of a topic and, and strategies to uh, deal with the when, not the what? Yeah, great question. Um, I think typically around 16. That's really the time frame where you begin seeing some of our boys getting into to grade 10 is where they might begin to experiment. Um, and I would be open and honest with them. You know, you have to have trust in your relationship with your children. So be, be open and educate them on the health consequences that are associated with it. Know that it might occur. Any time is a teachable moment. So if they stumble home one night, 
coming back to, to the message on character, coming back to the health consequences associated with it, knowing that it can harm the brain, it can harm their body, going through maybe a few case studies of, of students in, in Vancouver that maybe have, have gone down a negative path because of that decision. But I would say continue to educate, be open with them, um, build that trust. And, and I know with my own dad and my own mom, who used to wait up for me at nighttime coming home, um, having that level of relationship, not being talked down to about the matter, but just providing me with education to make my own choices went a long way, um, especially as an athlete, uh, knowing that this behavior could impact my future as a football player or as a student um, allowed me to navigate towards a more positive path. So, yeah. I just want to comment on that because sure. I probably would want to emphasize like the drinking driving component mm -hmm. and some of them might not be young enough, but they're too young to drive, so to make sure they're not getting into cars and getting into accidents. Great. Yeah. Really important. Thank you. Okay. All right, so this is uh, going to be my, my conclusion. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate really the key advice that I've given you uh, to this point. So what can we do as parents to help support our boys during these challenging years? Boys are craving. So number one, rules without relationships lead to rebellion. Boys are craving close bonds and relationships, especially in middle school. Invest time in building a relationship with your son. Think about scheduling one time per week called special time where you and your son can spend quality time together. Try to schedule it prior to the week beginning and have your son decide on the plan. If he wants to go to the football field to throw the football around or if he wants to play a FIFA video game or if, if, you, if he wants to, to watch a movie, whatever he does or whatever he wants, that's what you should do. Know who your son's friends are because they are a reflection of your son. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. Make your house the social center of his life. Making your house the social center of your son will deepen your bond with your son and allow you to monitor his interactions. Two, God is worthy of praise. Your children are not. There is a fundamental difference between praising your child and encouraging him. No human should be at the center of the universe. That void is left for God. So when your son's term one report card comes home in late November, don't speak about how proud you are of them for getting straight A's. Encourage them. Billy, that is a wonderful accomplishment. Your hard work really paid off. There is a distinct difference between praise and encouragement. Great learning, including our personal and social growth, comes from failure. Educate your, ch your children about failure as a valuable learning tool. Encourage your child to fail and to pick up the stress ball. Non-catastrophic failure is a good thing. It teaches your child to be resilient, show grit, and it gives them overall strategies to overcome hardship in their life. Students need to fail. Life is not easy, and our boys need to, to learn how to show grit, perseverance, and bounce back from adverse situations. Do not be the snowplow parent. Leave those obstacles in front of your son. The new BC curriculum emphasizes the growth of each student through competencies, both curricular and core. This year, ensure that your conversations with your son highlight their longer term development and not their achievement in the now. Learning is personal for boys. That was said by Michael Reichart. We should understand that our boys will encounter struggles at some point this year. And in those moments, attentively listen, encourage them, appreciate their efforts, affirm their feelings, and reiterate the importance of process over achievement. Three, one thing I had learned from watching chimpanzees with their infants is that having a child should be fun. Jane Goodall. Parents face enormous pressures from the moms and dads that surround them and from themselves. Please do not let the stress get to you. Jane Goodall, a primatologist and mother of one, saw we're not so different from our animal friends. Just like the chimps, we should appreciate the joys of being present rather than obsessing about the uncertainty of the future or the failures of the past. Find ways to make light of situations and joke with your son. Laughter brings families together. 
For me, it was my dad telling corny jokes or singing Bob Seger songs in front of strangers that was completely embarrassing for my entire family that created a sense of social cohesion. Be playful. Life can be too serious a place not to have fun and laugh. Let your son win once in a while. Although this isn't something that my wife allows me, uh, I would encourage you to stand firm on the things that matter most, their friends and their technology use and allow your son to win some small battles along the way, whether that's having McDonald's for dinner, uh, watching the end of a football game when it's creeping into his curfew, or even allowing him to wear those navy blue sweatpants to Sunday family dinner. All right. Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. Brene Brown. This period of your son's life will only last so long, I promise you, with vulnerability, comes transformation. Love your son, establish a strong connection with him, know his friends, monitor his technology, and most importantly, educate and equip him with the skills to take on peer pressure and conflict. Your son might be an ugly caterpillar today. However, he will eventually spread his wings and transform into a less ugly, less smelly, less irritable butterfly in the coming years. So just some advice for you. Um, Three really uh, amazing reads if you have time or an opportunity. The first is How to Raise a Boy, written by Michael Reichart. Much of what I spoke about today uh, would be emphasized in the first book. The next two, The Gift of Failure and Blessings of a Skinned Knee. It's all about failure and the importance of failure to bringing out the best in our children. Before we leave today, I was hoping that I could say a prayer with all of you because I realize how challenging the job that you have in front of you is. Uh, and I was hoping that we could just take some time to reflect, uh, to bring Jesus into our hearts and, uh, and to go off and, and do our best with our middle school boys. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All praise to you, Lord Jesus, creator of children, Bless our families and help us to lead our children to you. Give us light and strength and courage when our task is difficult. Let your spirit fill us with love and peace so that we may help our children to love you. All glory and praise are yours, Lord Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Edmund Rice, live Jesus in our hearts. Thank you so much. I should probably say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a flub on my part. We'll have to edit that out on YouTube, please, okay? <laughs> I don't know how Mr. Bavaco would feel about that prayer. Um, but thank you so much for spending some time uh, with me today. I know how busy you all are with how many children you have and responsibilities professionally and personally. And I really appreciate you being here. And it, it just shows um, how committed you are to, to improving um, not just your son's life, but, uh, but your family's uh, day to day. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And if you ever have any questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to, to either knock on my door, send me an email, or, or give me a call. Okay, thank you.